We're ready now to start our first panel of this afternoon, and this will be headed up by our executive director, Patrick Key. It's looking at this question that we've kept touching upon the whole time, what is actually the impact for citizens, what are their concerns, and what can we do about it? I'll now hand over to Patrick to also introduce the rest of his panel. Thank you. Okay. I don't bite, so you can sit <laughs> close to me as well. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, during my, my remarks on the highlights of uh, EASA's works in the last years, um, I talked in some detail about the UAM study that we carried out to understand citizens' concerns. And in our panel, we want to follow through on this uh, subject by talking to people who are closely involved in this question of public acceptance from different angles. And the aim is to understand the experiences they have had so far and any measures they have taken to address concerns in their operations and work in this area so far. We deliberately uh, chose speakers with a diverse experience so we can get a broader picture of the actual issues encountered in different projects and ideas for solutions. And uh, I would uh, like to start by introducing our speakers. Um, first, uh, Frédéric Bruder, CEO and Accountable Manager of ADAC uh, Luftrettung, which is the main uh, uh, helicopter emergency and medical services uh, operator in Germany. Marc Walla, who is the General Director of Aéroport de Paris, Charles de Gaulle. Bobby Healy, who is the CEO and founder of MANA Drone Delivery, one of few drone delivery companies which are actually operating as we speak. I hope they, are, they can operate if you are not there. Operating today, yeah. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, Dominique Lazarski, president of UECNA, which uh, means European, Un European Union Against Aircraft Nuisances. Okay? So, maybe, maybe we can start with Bobby. Uh, Bobby, you are, you are presently conducting U.S. operations for deliver, delivering of goods over sparsely populated areas, and it seems that your business is very successful. Congratulations for that. Could you talk to us about your present operations, if you, have, uh, uh, if you are facing any concerns from citizens, and if so, what are you do doing uh, to resolve them? The floor is yeah. yours. Thanks, Patrick. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invite. Um, so, yeah, we're live. We're flying um, in a town north of Dublin Airport, about 10 minutes from Dublin Airport. There's 35,000 people in the town, 10,000 homes. And we fly from the very centre of the town, about a two-kilometre radius from uh, a, a Tesco, and we fly from their roof. Um, we're flying capacity up to about 400 <coughs> deliveries a day. And we've done 95, just over 95,000 fully autonomous delivery flights. And um, so we, this is our third town that we've operated in in Ireland. The first one, 1,000 people. The second one, 10,000 people. And this one, 35,000. So each time the operation gets more complex and we learn a little bit more about the, 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 the response from the locals. And I have to say, you know, even before when we surveyed, we got a 98% positive uh, willingness to use drone delivery. And the real test is after you've rolled out. And we're live now for two years, just over two years doing this. So we've seen a, a really um, a huge positive response from the users of the service, the local businesses that we power. And, and the local business community. So for right everywhere from the Chamber of Commerce to local government to central government <coughs> have been very positive <coughs> about it. Do we get complaints? Yes, um, but very, very few. And when I think about the fact that we've been operating for over two years now to a population over 46,000 people, I could count on these two hands the number of complaints that we've had. Does that mean we're through the gate and the problem is solved? No, absolutely not, because we're still a trial operation and we haven't scaled fully. We don't know what full scale looks like. We don't know how frequently 
people will use a service like this, but we do think they're going to use it every single day. We think that the average consumer at home is going to be using a drone every single day. That means that there's going to be a lot of flight movements, right? So we don't know what the end state looks like, and we definitely, you know, there's, there's a number of things that are easy to do around flight planning and altitude and things like that, and a number of things that will just involve going hand in hand with the community and making sure that the community is the most important stakeholder in the operation, right? So it isn't the type of business like an Uber or a scooter company that you can just rock up to the town and start operating. You do it holding hands with the local community and involving them as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I can report happily that at least in Europe, uh, we've seen an excellent community response to what we're doing with little or no complaints. In, in practice, what do you deliver? What are the goods that you deliver? Um, not the world's most important <coughs> use case. Um, <coughs> groceries uh, are number one thing. Uh, food, prepared food, takeaway food, coffees, pharmacy, a defibrillator. So pretty much everything that you can carry. Our aircraft is a MTOW of 23, 24 kilos, and our new aircraft can take three and a half kilos cargo, 30,000 cubic centimeters, so it's a big payload. Um, but we want, to, we want to completely, so our mission is to completely replace the car. And that's okay. it. So we want to carry everything that people need in the community. So just to understand, you have people who are ordering coffee to be delivered by drone. And, and, and how do you make sure that it's and not, uh, as a, not as a stunt? Like we have people that have, uh, have ordered over 100 times from us. So this isn't, you know, let's have a bit of fun, order a drone. This is, I need a coffee. And our flight time in this town is 2 minutes 40 seconds outbound flight time. <laughs> so the coffee is piping hot. Pint of Guinness is perfect, d delivered by drone. <laughs> right? um, but more importantly to others, like we have users that are in their late 70s that use us. They don't even have smartphones. <coughs> they call us. We have a phone number they can call. And we've delivered prescription medicine in Ireland in conjunction with the Irish government. So, you know, we don't really think about any particular use case. We want every single thing brought to people's homes. And there's very, very important community reasons that you want to do that. And most importantly, as we said, we, we ran for a year delivering prescription medicines end to end in Ireland, and it was a great response. And, and literally, we, we hit 90% of the homes with that product, 90% of them used the service. And in our current, in our, in our last town in the west coast of Galway, which is <coughs> 10,000 people, 38% of the population use the service on a regular basis, 38%. I mean, if you want proof that people want <coughs> their own delivery, that's it in data. Hmm. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Bobby. Let's continue with Frédéric. Uh, Frédéric, you are uh, the operator of manned and unmanned systems. Uh, your type of operations are different from those of Bobby. I, I don't think you deliver coffee or, or goods yet. My pilots would love it. But no. <laughs> um. So you are mainly conducting emergency services operations, but uh, I, I will ask you the same question. Have you, have you met uh, a concern expressed to you by citizens? And if yes, uh, how do you address them? Yes, so thank you for the invite. Um, as you introduced me, uh, we operate uh, roughly 55 helicopters in Germany and EMS services, uh, performing roughly 55,000 missions per year solely on EMS. And we operate on some bases 24-7, on other bases just from uh, sunrise to sundown. And obviously we do get some noise complaints, probably less than other services because ultimately the use case that we have is saving lives, so it may sound a bit theoretical, but, but that's the way it is. Uh, we do observe, though, that, that noise complaints are quite often subjective. <coughs> if, if you look at operations in July, where we will have a heart attack and then fly with a helicopter on a mission at 6 p.m., you won't have any complaint. If you do the same mission in February, when it's dark at 6 p.m., you will get noise complaints. Because subjectively, for people, it's going to be the middle of the night, where the reality says that it's 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. So it's something we have to deal with on a regular basis. And then and the three biggest challenges we have today in any EMS operations are cost, noise, and emissions. And this is why we're looking at the new technologies, maybe to address some of those issues, if not all three of them. 
Mm -hmm. So the business model for you is positive of moving towards US or UAM? I, it will be complementary. It won't be substitutional, at least not for the next 10 to 15 years because technology <coughs> won't be there. <coughs> But to give you an idea, the German HEM systems on helicopters, roughly 60 to 70 of our missions, we do not transport the patient on board of the helicopter. We're basically just a taxi for the med crew and especially for the doctor. So on those missions, you know, using an asset today <coughs> that weighs three to four tons and costs eight to 10 million euros with uh, an operating cost around three to 4,000 euros a flat hour, you know, if this could be replaced, at least for those missions, by something cheaper with less noise and then just as safe, and this is probably one of the biggest tasks we have, how to make it safe, because in our type of service, as well as in any other service, but we do fly in congested hostile environments in cities. We land in the middle of the street in your backyard on a highway, so we need to make sure that safety, you know, is, is our paramount issue. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to... I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Let me turn to Mark. Uh, after these very uh, interesting uh, first uh, interventions, um, Uh, Mark, we heard uh, Florian uh, talking about uh, this project of starting uh, urban air mobility d during uh, Olympic Games in Paris in 2024. And with such a, a, a visible uh, project in Paris, and one of the fir world's first implementation of uh, regular UAM services, I expect that you are already dealing with uh, this question of societal acceptance. So could you please elaborate on this? And what are the main concerns of the <coughs> Paris citizens and how do you plan to address those? Well, f f first of all, maybe uh, um, some words about the group AP. We have just uh, uh, recently released a new strate strategic roadmap. And in this roadmap, we highlight the importance, the paramount importance of decarbonation first and the innovation into in aviation. And the fact is now we strongly believe that UAM could uh, achieve those two objectives and could reconcile the uh, reduction of the uh, environmental footprint, uh, the promotion of innovation, and also the development of new services to the general public. And in order to, uh, to develop or to to uh, uh, promote those, uh, those UAM activities, we have a project, and we have this project of delivering an e-vital um, passenger service uh, at the beginning of the Olympic Games, 2024, uh, from Paris CDG to various points of interest in, uh, in the surrounding of Paris. In order to put this project into and to implement this project, we have, uh, we have developed uh, what we call uh, a sandbox, which is basically uh, a flight test platform in one, uh, uh, in one airport that we operate at uh, Group CDG, which is Pontoise Airport, something located something at 35 kilometers from Paris. And what we did is we gather in this platform uh, a lot of partners. Transportation partners are like uh, um, Paris Region and RATP. Uh, some technical partners uh, with whom we are building a, a regulatory framework. So, we, of course, the uh, EASA and also the French Civil Aviation Authority to tackle regulatory uh, concerns. And also the local community. Basically, we say to the local community, come and have exchange with ex some exchanges with us, and we will try to tackle those, those, the concerns that you have. So this platform right away, <coughs> right now, we uh, basically what we, we, in we intend to do is to tackle those, those uh, social or community or general public concerns, such as noise, definitely, which one of the main problems but UAM will deliver some, some benefits compared to helicopters, for example. Uh, safety, security, uh, but also some technical problems, such as you know, uh, the management of energy, uh, how to take off and land on the vertiport, uh, how to board and onboard passengers, and so on and so forth. All those things will be, uh, uh, the, the, will be tackled through this, this uh, 
platform. Uh, basically, we, uh, we strongly believe that those trials uh, will be conducive to establishing a proof of concept, to establishing the feasibility of such a, a, a service, and also um, will be a good way of establishing um, and, and find out, finding out the main concerns of the community. Okay. Dominique, you are representing the citizens <coughs> and uh, you are becoming a, <coughs> a drone expert, a UAM expert. You were part of uh, our UAM task force and uh, you, we have been working together for, for some time. Your main area of work is aircraft noise, but uh, today it shows that uh, your, your work goes be beyond that. <coughs> Can you tell us, uh, explain to us, what are the main concerns uh, that you see um, um, for which we will be facing societal acceptance with UAM operations? What are the, the challenges that you see from your perspective? Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to give a citizen view on um, UAM. Uh, and I'm not an expert, unfortunately, someday maybe I will. I'm learning a lot and I'm learning here as well from the people I've met uh, upstairs. Um, yes, uh, I've been sharing uh, Vecna for some time now and um, this is an NGO created in 1968, so 54 years ago, uh, to represent the European citizens um, suffering from aircraft pollution, mainly noise and um, deteriorated air quality around um, airports. But today we're considering a new type of transport by air, moving from airports to the cities and the country, uh, countryside. Um, and this cannot be done without consequence for the environment. But I have nothing really new to say. I mean, um, you are all citizens, and um, although you may probably have uh, sympathy for um, drones, you may also share my concerns, because um, they concern everyone. Um, so, I'm an ordinary citizen. Um, why do I fear? What do I fear? Um, it's all in your report, in the Azar's report. Safety, security, fear of uh, terrorist attacks. Um, in France, recently, there was a gang of burglars which was dismantled, and they were using drones to check that people were asleep in homes before entering uh, to steal from um, these homes. Um, one of the main concerns probably is privacy. Um, we see that unmanned uh, vehicles have um, cameras. Um, are they going to fly over your properties, your gardens? Uh, what are we doing, going to do with the videos? Who are, are you selling them to? Um, police forces, marketing agencies? How much of our privacy are we ready to, are we ready to give up? Um, impact on wild, wildlife, obviously, you know, in the air, we have the birds, many birds in the cities, they're important for us. Um, but noise, surely, uh, your, our main concerns, your main concern, because you need these vehicles to be um, accepted, our main concern, because <coughs> I was at um, this test on Monday, uh, Volocopter's test, um, it was very interesting. First time I heard one of these uh, flying taxis, uh, smaller than the final um, um, vehicle, uh, and yet louder than uh, advertised. So um, surely it will be much better than helicopters. But um, uh, what about uh, these areas where people are not yet affected by aircraft noise or helicopter noise? quiet areas, a time when cities become quieter with urban designing, traffic restrictions, multiplication of public transport, soft transport with scooters, bicycles, um, electric engines on um, buses, cars, they, they're becoming really quiet now in cities. Um, how are UAM operators could add noise? And, um, um, will, will they all be electric? How are you going to uh, produce all this electricity to move the vehicles on the land and in the sky? Um, 
If not electric, what would be the environmental impact? Because I don't, I'm not sure they're all electric. Um, we have the Environmental Noise Directive 2002, and um, it aims at reducing the noise in towns that, and um, around the airports. Regarding regular aircraft, we already knew, we have pointed out that um, there are weaknesses um, of this directive. Um, it's not ambitious enough, uh, not um, always properly implemented uh, by member states. Noise levels should be at WHO's recommendations. Uh, the night should be better protected with no air traffic for an eight hour period. How will UAM impact on the directive? How will they fit in um, on the noise maps, on the noise action plans? Certification by EASA. Uh, noise standards should be adapted to UAM. It's nothing to compare with air, traditional aircraft or even helicopters and you're basing your the basis of uh, the certifi certifi noise certification could be um, on uh, helicopter um, standards. Um, flight path. Imagine, do you have a garden? You have a garden, maybe. You have a garden? You're in your garden, in the sun, or in the public um, garden, or um, on your balcony. It was very sunny the last few days in Paris. You know, we were enjoying it. Uh, enjoying the sun and the warm, and uh, and you have this um, UAM regularly passing over you. Would you like them? Would you, you would you enjoy that? Probably not. And I'm sure that most of the other people will think like you and would not enjoy them. So we have to think really about the flight paths. And we're talking about putting the flight path over motorways or wing roads. Ring roads and motorways are in, in town. There are many buildings around and residential buildings, not just office buildings, residential buildings. How are we, are we going to protect these people who already suffer a lot from the traffic noise on land? And we will add some um, aircraft noise. Um, yes, so um, UAM operators are seeking uh, acceptance from the citizens, from the public. And I have noted that um, it's very striking. You know, it's, it's, I, I was watching all the videos and uh, reading publications and, uh, and what operators put in the spotlight is the use to transport medic medicine, organs, injured people. <coughs> it looks like... Um, Health, what I would call health washing. Sorry for that. <laughs> I like that word. You <laughs> said that the other day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> health washing. In fact, is it really, you know, some, some operators will probably be really involved in healthcare, and, uh, but what will be the main use? Every I mean, day, you say it. Everyday things. Groceries, <laughs> yeah. coffee, beers. Is this what we want? I mean, do we need this in the minute? Yeah. Or can we plan it in advance? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, with Amazon already, we created the need for um, a, a very um, fast delivery. And you are accelerating this. Mm -hmm. Do we need this? Do we want this? I don't know. Well, if, if you're out of Guinness, I think it's an uh, I mean, yeah. sort of emergency. You can have an emergency <laughs> Guinness delivery. Yeah. I mean, we're starting from I've scratch been that guy. here. We're starting from scratch. We, yes. we need to do it well. Yes, I, I mean, agree. Uh, we have made mistakes in the past for cars, for instance. But now we're removing the cars from the cities. Have noted in most cities. Well, how do we want to add air vehicles? Possibly, possibly, Dominique. And uh, we are here to discuss about this. Uh, <laughs> so, how, how does it work, Janet? We, we have. Yeah. Um, we, now we have Sligo open. So, if you have questions that you would like to ask to the panel, then we want you to do this through the Slido tool. To do that, you need to go to slido.com and put in, yes, it's up there, put in this number, hashtag 855146. That allows you to put in. Um, questions to this panel. Thank you. Okay. But maybe I can get uh, Bobby to, to answer to Dominique because I'm yeah. pretty sure you have <coughs> a number of yeah, answers. So, yes. so brilliantly put, uh, very eloquently put, and it's, great, it's a great idea to have someone representing you know, the people on the ground that we fly over. Um, 
I'm privileged that we're, we've been live for two years, so I see those conversations and, and I go visit the people that don't like us. And there's people that don't like us. Now, it's a small sample, of course, um, but, but I, I see the concerns. And you know, the, the biggest one that you spoke about, wildlife, is the one that nobody fully understands. Right? There's actually no research today that correctly calculates whatever the effect is going to be on pollination, bird migration, any of those things. So nobody knows plus or minus. The only anecdotal data I have is that people, when you roll out the service, they don't complain. So we're not seeing today anyway any major pushback, but it's, it's early days. To your very valid point about what, what I would say is less to do with UAM and delivery and more about consumerism, Right, so do people really need to consume as much as they do? We can't solve that. That's not, you know, my, my, the way I think about this, because I have four children, right? I think I don't want them to be Amazon customers. I don't want them to order a light bulb that arrives from four continents away or two continents away. And um, so I think about that a lot. And then I think about you know, the local bookshop that uses our service beats Amazon every day with book delivery, right? They can order a book from a local bookshop employing a local person, a family business, and get a book to somebody in four minutes. Do they need the book in four minutes? Is it an emergency? Of course not. But the alternative is they will use Amazon. They're going to use Amazon. And our alternative is creating local jobs in local communities with an inevitable reality that people are going to consume, <coughs> doing it in a way that at least for sure produces zero CO2 when we fly. And our job is to do that safely, respecting privacy at a aviation level of safety. And if we can do that at scale, we're going to remove cars from the road and we're going to let communities have products and local businesses that beat Amazon every day. And that's something that, that I see as a mission for our business to do. And, and I, I do take all of your points about, do we really want to look up in the sky and see those objects? That part is an emotional argument, and it's a valid one. And I don't know the answer to that. But all I can say is that two years later, 46,000 people later, I could count on these two hands how many people ask us to leave. Mark, you want to, to answer to some of the points made by Dominique? No, no, Dominique is right. We, we, we have to take into account the uh, uh, community concerns and general public concerns. That's why we are doing, we are doing those tests, you know. And for example, we, we, we have been doing some <coughs> flying tests um, in Pontoise. And so the, the UAM, the VTOL, the Volocopter uh, VTOL was able to... Uh, uh, to fly like 25 meters from, from the ground and 50 meters from the ground. And what like I say right now is that uh, I was really amazed. Uh, we, we were able to speak to each other, whispering, whispering, and, we, and hearing each other. It's nothing in common with a helicopter. It's some, and, and of course, but, but of course, we, and at the same time, we, we have a conducting a, a survey um, about the community concern, the general public concern about uh, the, the, their concern in UAM, and the results of those surveys will be uh, delivered pretty soon in the in coming months. So we'll, we'll be uh, more aware of, aware of what are our uh, community concerns. Mm. Again, uh, we, we have to build something upon their concerns, but um, you know, when you deal with UAM, it's really I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's noiseless, but there is nothing in common with even a car or um, or um, um, a helicopter. That that is the first point, and the second point is fully electrical, so no generation of CO2, and those two things are the main concern. And with UAM, we uh, we overcome those those ones. Mm. So it's pretty promising. Okay. Frédéric, it seems that uh, even Dominique agrees with your UAM operations. <laughs> huh? so, so you have a <laughs> green signal from our, from our side. Do you have anything to add to, to, to all this? Well, the, the one thing that we, we may see slightly differently is, is the CO2 thing. Um, we do not believe yet that, that the solution will be only electric. 
um, you may have seen that we are testing biofuels today on our rescue helicopters, uh, significantly reducing CO2 by, by 40% for the time being. Eventually, we want to go up to power to liquid, which would reduce CO2 by almost 100%. So I think that this approach may also be a viable one next to only the electric thing. The big advantage of, of electric is, is, or there are two in our point of view, one is noise, you know, because it is differently... Uh, a bit more silent than than uh, regular engines, and the other one is costs, you know, which is uh, significantly cheaper than regular turbine engines and so on. But addressing you know the topics one at a time, noise, uh, safety, and 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 uh, CO2 reduction and cost, maybe the fourth one, you know, we believe that step by step we can go there. And and the last thing I, I would like to add is, you know, we can't stop progress. You know, and, and I think that the challenge we have as, as companies, as regulators, as innovators is on how to utilize this progress to the benefit of people and the citizens. So it's a trade-off ultimately at the end of the day, but if you look at smartphones, you know, 15 years ago they didn't exist, 25 years ago cell phones almost didn't exist, and many of our parents, you know, couldn't imagine, you know, why this would be useful. useful. You know, and I think today it's difficult to imagine how to live without those. And then if we go on the health thing again, if you look at wearables and all these things in the future that will be able to tell you whether you should go immediately to a doctor because you may have, you know, a stroke or heart attack coming, um, I think w we should not stop those technologies. But we have a responsibility, you know, that's for sure, on how to make them, you know, beneficial for, for society in general. Dominique, you want to react? Yes, just, <coughs> just on um, <coughs> non-electric uh, drones. Um, non-electric drones, you're talking about CO2, but it's not just t CO2. It's also, do, would, you have, would you produce NOxes, for instance, or UFPs, ultrafine particles? Because these are big concerns regarding aircraft, traditional aircraft. Let's not start on non-CO2 emissions of uh, aviation. No, no, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, have uh, another uh, conference on this. It's local pollution. You know, yes, this is yes, local yes. No, pollution, but I, I, I don't not disagree. greenhouse gas. Yes, I don't disagree. <laughs> how, how are we doing on the slide of questions? I'm sorry, but uh, Janet, I cannot, uh, unless anyone can read what's I can't on read the screen. So what, what are the questions, Janet? Second. I'm going to zoom mm. in with my camera. So I have one question here which says, when last mile delivery drones will go on from delivering coffee to delivering more valuable goods, such as eye toys, are you scared of the ground air risk? People shooting down for the value and not thinking that they're endangering people oh, on the ground? Interesting. That was a long question. <laughs> <laughs> um, All the questions are about that later. <laughs> I'm very scared about the ground risk. In fact, safety is my number one focus. And I, it's the only, I've ran, this is the fourth business that I've started and run. And it's the first time I've ever worried about a business that I run. Safety is very, very difficult to achieve at scale, particularly when you're flying at 50 to 80 meters and people could fire objects at you. Um, so we do a lot of testing around total system failure, losing two or more propellers. So we have parachutes, we have all these different systems to make the ground safe, even in the worst eventuality. And will people do that? 100% there's going to be malicious activity that is outside of our control. And all we can do is mitigate against that and hope that um, people pretty soon get bored with, with what we do. And you know, so, so the other question is, when will we move away from coffee? Coffee isn't the only thing we deliver. Every, every day we deliver pharmacy to the community we serve, to elderly people in the community. And particularly during COVID, during lockdown, when elderly and vulnerable people were asked to cocoon and um, they had no options to, to go out to the store to get food and we did free delivery services to those people. So we do know about fulfilling our role, our civic role in the community and we do feel, fulfill that role every single day. Um, but the reality is, believe it or not, coffee will be the number one use case on the planet for drones for the next few years. And that's ridiculous. And everyone's muttering and laughing. Come, you're all invited to come to Dublin, and I'd be happy to show you and introduce you to the community that we power, the local bookshop, the local restaurant, the local grocery, grocery everyone. They just can't get enough of the service. Um, so the, like, we can't avoid the reality that consumers will consume. 
And right now, their options are to get in their car today and drive two, four, five, six kilometers in the petrol or diesel car to get their coffee, right? And the road is not an efficient device for that. Drones are better in probably every single way than the, ro and than the road. Let's, uh, let's, let's <laughs> no, I thought in Dublin you had pubs all uh, everywhere, and oh, we you do. don't have to drive. For oh, so it's, it's worth it's worth <laughs> it's worth pointing out actually when you think it when you look at us the, the, the lens you need to apply to us is suburban doesn't work for what we do. It's always going to be suburban, so kind of medium density population. So we need a space. We need about a two meter diameter flat area to deliver in. So actually, we don't believe drone delivery, in its, at least in any form we can envisage, will ever happen in very dense urban locations. Apologies to the Parisians uh, here and the New Yorkers and the San Franciscans, but it's, it's the other 60, 70 percent of the European population that have those big back gardens that will never have a, an efficient public transport that lets them get to the local coffee shop or the local grocery store. They're all getting in their cars today and for a long time they're going to get in their cars and the electric car that drives past your house makes more noise than our aircraft does and we've got science we've got data to prove that so we know that we're better than any alternative in the next 10 years and we're pretty proud to replace that alternative as well mm. uh, we, we will take that as a as a key performance indicators your statement bobby uh, coffee delivery will be the number one delivery in the world. You we will check that. that. We will check that every year at our conference. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hands up! Hands up! Everyone who gets pharmacy delivery every single day. <laughs> Good. <Well. laughs> There's some really sick people in the world, but <laughs> nobody gets it every single day. Um, but everyone gets in their car at some point, multiple mm. times during the week, to go to the grocery store, to go to the restaurant, to get stuff. And that's what we want to get rid of. Mm. Okay, we, you, you talked about, about safety, and um, uh, of course we are a safety agency, so this is really close to our hearts. Do you think, Frédéric for instance, that we can get to a point where drone deliveries, um, UAM, can be as safe as commercial transport? And what does it take to get there? Well, th th that is a challenging question. I think that there's a big difference, first of all, between bigger flying objects, let's call them like this, you know, like multi-copters and, 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 <coughs> and smaller drones. And I think that a big part of the risk that, that we're going to face is that it's going to be crowded up there. You know, aviation in the last five to six decades, you know, was quite easy because the skies were empty. So the probability that you may encounter another flying vehicle was uh, was quite small. And and with the drastic increase, I think there was above a million drones today compared to how many 10,000 aircrafts, regular aircrafts maybe. Uh, um, so this is going to be apart from the, 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 the technical challenges of, of keeping the devices in the air, which I think is... is probably easy to solve, you know, um, air traffic management, which didn't play that big of a role 50 years ago, will be paramount in, in, in making it safe. So, so mm. that's what we are most concerned about, because we are sharing an airspace that is getting more and more crowded, and, and, and this will be a, a very significant challenge. Mm. Mark, I, I, I took the service once, and I will never do that again, of a motorbike taxi <laughs> from Charles de Gaulle to the center of Paris which I'm, I'm not sure is the safest uh, mode of transport on Earth. But do you think that uh, uh, this, the le this level of safety is sufficient for urban air mobility, or should we aim for something much, uh, much higher? Well, what I think is, uh, thankfully, we have ESA. So, um, so probably that um, if we go on and, and we aim at, at developing these commercial activities, then you will ask for... Uh, high level of certification, probably the cost will be higher, um, Florian, sorry, uh, but, but, but then the safety will be the same as the one you can have with, uh, with those commercial activity standards, which is very high and which, is, uh, which has nothing in common with uh, uh, the guy picking you up at the airport you know, uh, and drive you to uh, the center of Paris. So this for sure. And, and uh, when you think of, of especially eVTOL, not drones, 
you are, uh, I don't expect having uh, an eVTOL uh, just uh, above, uh, above my house. Those kind of vehicles, they will follow the, probably the helicopter tracks in order to be safe, and, and especially if there are passengers in it. You know, you know more than me that the standards of safety is completely different, whereas you uh, deal with commercial activities or non-commercial activities. Mm. So I think that the, the standard of, of, of uh, uh, the quality standard of in terms of safety will be much higher than any road transportation for sure. Mm. Bobby, what should be the safety standard for um, delivery by drone? Um, exactly the same as general aviation, no less. Mm. The, and, and the reason is um, the volume of flights that we will do will be far greater than general aviation. Even though the ground risk is less, we have a, we, you know, ultimately we think we'll be about a 20 kilo object. So less kinetic energy, no people on board, so less ground risk, but way more volume. So the mechanical, so, so we're going through design verification on our side. Do we think that's enough? Yes, for now. But ahead of full scale, we think type search is probably a valid path for organizations like ours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dominique, you agree with that? Yeah, uh, yes, I do, yes. But wh what are you going to do when the competition will be there and uh, you have to share your space? Um, we plan to do that this year. Uh, we're already in conversation with one of the competition and we're going to demonstrate it, uh, hopefully in Ireland, but definitely in Europe. And technically, that's not a difficult problem to solve. It just there's standards there, there's software systems there that are, are really not difficult problems to solve. But to show it actually operating, I think, uh, will be an important part, an important next step, not just for for Europe and for EASA and, and all of the stakeholders, but important as well that we don't, when we open up the airspace and liberalize the airspace in Europe, that we don't create monopolies. And so it's very important that we have a federalized airspace that everyone can share and get equal access to. And a better example, well, we're, we're gonna work with a, with a, with a partner slash competitor to do this, um, to demonstrate that it can be done. And uh, there's other use cases, and it's actually ambulance, th the one I always say is, is right of way, right? Priority for traffic and how does that work? There are systems, UTM and USpace has the, the, the definitions and the standards for that. So that if the ambulance helicopter is going to take off and come anywhere near what we do, we have a system to, to, to land, to go back home, to take care of that. So that, funnily enough, is one of the easier uh, problems to solve. Uh, again, I say, the most difficult problem to solve, I don't believe, is adoption. Certainly, it's not adoption. Everyone, or not everyone, but it's adoption is there. Um, or acceptance. I actually think that acceptance will largely be there for what we do. The difficult problem is, and this is a very difficult problem, how do you fly a million times a day without causing a problem? Mm -hmm. And that's not solved, but that's, that's what you have technology for. Th th there's a question here about a question about corridors. I saw a slide. Yeah, yeah. I saw a slide um, the other day when we spoke, <laughs> and uh, I, I could see that you had um, trajectory all over the city without yeah, corridors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what yeah, it's a very good, good observation. Uh, and anyone who follows me on Twitter, they'll see that picture. It's on my Twitter feed. So I posted a picture of, our, of all of our flight maps for a weekend uh, in the town we operate. And it's more or less crow flies. So we, we avoid certain areas like schools, things like that of very built up areas. And then what you don't see is altitude. So when we look at, there are no corridors. Well, there, there's kind of natural corridors because of where all the homes are. There's a lot of gaps in where the houses are built. So mostly we fly as the crow flies and we'll, we'll optimize a little bit due to wind direction, wind speed. Um, but largely we fly as the crow flies. However, for the immediate radius around our, our, our area where we operate, for example, for the first 500 meters that we travel where those homes will get see more flights than the homes on the perimeter, we can go upwards to over 100 meters altitude where we're literally a speck in the sky and you cannot hear us. So that's our approach. That Our approach is go higher for the, er, for the concentric circles close to us. And we're not sure if that's the perfect answer, um, but it certainly, so far anyway, has served us very well. And so, so we don't get any complaints from those close houses. And then the other part is, and again, you'll see it on my Twitter feed, trying to build my Twitter audience here. Um, the last town we operate, which was 10,000 people, 
we did it with corridors. And you'll see that picture if you scroll down far enough. But we went out in corridors and then fanned out to the houses. And we did that as a kind of a sign of respect to the community, that this was the first large community that we had served. And we wanted them to, to, to know that we had thought about it. And we were doing it this way, because we're not sure if it's better or worse, but we think that that shows you know, a kind of a mark of respect to the community that are giving us permission to fly over them. And in the end, it, you know, they didn't care. You know, and they wanted, instead of it being like a, an eight minute, nine minute flight, now we do it in a, you know, a four minute, five minute round trip flight, and the complaints are just not there. But we're still small scale. Uh, and what about your cameras? Are, are they we don't have cameras. You don't have cameras? No. So there's, no there's no world. I, I, I missed your point there. There's no world where what we're doing should be allowed to have any recording devices on. The how, how do you, you LIDAR. check that uh, we use there's LIDAR. no one? Oh. We use LiDAR. So LiDAR is a, is a, it's a much safer, much more reliable technology um, than cameras anyway, because they work in rain and fog and, and darkness. Um, but most importantly, you can't distinguish anything of, priv of a private nature. Mm. So that, that's, LiDAR is probably the best approach. There's also radar. We're currently evaluating lightweight radar. And radar is even less granular, so it's even less detail. But the nice thing about radar, we believe, and this goes to my million flights a day problem to solve, one of the things that radar can help you with is object detection as you fly. So for an autonomous aircraft, that would let us spot illegal drones that are flying in our airspace or birds that might be you know, in our path. And so a combination of LiDAR and radar, I believe, is a valid technological approach to solving the problem and the respect privacy. There is no world where anyone should be allowed to have a camera flying over uninvolved people. That's my view. Mm. How are we doing on the Slido uh, questions? I've got a couple more questions that I would ask here. One of them goes to Frederick Bruder. And the question is that when citizens are complaining about um, noise, do they actually realize they're complaining about a rescue service? Uh, I believe they do. Um, and, 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 you know, I have to, to, to protect them a little bit too. It's different if you live, you know, in, uh, in the countryside and you have a helicopter flying by once a month or even less, or if you live close <laughs> to a hospital, you know, and then you have. 15, 20, 30 flights and, and, and landings per day, so there, there will be a huge difference. It's like people living close by a fire station, you know, when they get out with their trucks and the sirens on, people complain about that too. Until the day that they're a victim themselves, and then they'll never complain again. So what we like to say, it's basically, it's not noise, you know, it's the sound of rescue. And, and um, so that's how people okay. eventually yeah. start understanding it. Yeah. And then there's one for Dominique. Um, which is really looking at the question of how, in your mind, we might be able to communicate with the general public so they'd have better acceptance of, of this. Um, well, I, I don't really know. In fact, um, there's a point where do we want more noise? I don't think so. So, so how are you going to fit? You're either in the city or in the country, okay? In the country, in countryside, um, you're in, often in a quiet environment. You don't want additional noise. In the city, it's the same. Uh, as I said, you know, you were taking the, the cars out of the city. It's not to put, to, to, to put a new noise problem. Um, so we, we should have st st noise standard at quite a low level. Well, it it depends. What we are, yes. we are trying to do as well is just to substitute the uh, helicopter by UAM, which are much le less noisy than, mm. than a helicopter. So yes, they yeah. are much less noisy, yeah. of course. Yes. So that's, I think that's, uh, it's a point that we have to try to, to develop, is how we can substitute for services those helicopters and put in instead some EVs. Or yeah. and that's a, that would be a, a huge uh, asset for the community as well. Probably, yes. Mm. Um, the problem would be how many um, EV toll will you add for one helicopter? It's the problem of uh, Concorde. You know, Concorde was very loud, but there was mm. only two a day. So, so <laughs> but they were very loud. <laughs> they were very loud. I was living in Toulouse. I but if, if, here, you, uh, if you replace helicopters with um, EV toll and uh, you have 100 for one helicopter, it could be a problem. Mm. But it's a different kind of problem, and uh, we need to look into it. We need to 
find out how we can reach out to community and uh, possibly with uh, your association we can do uh, a bit of that to, to, to help uh, consumers but also citizens understand that the noise patterns are going to be quite different. I'm not saying it's, uh, it's better or worse, it's different. And we need people to understand that uh, the, the noise of a drone is completely different from yeah. the noise of I a mean, truck. I, I have a great, you know, when I, th that's the number one, I won't say complaint, but question I get on social media or LinkedIn or whatever. It's what about the noise? I don't want any, and, and completely valid, right? Everyone is worried, everyone is worried about the noise because everyone is at a, a small little DJI drone. They don't like the sound of it. I have some great videos, real videos taken with just ordinary, you know, cameras, phone cameras that when people troll me on Twitter or, or LinkedIn, or whatever, and they say, you know, I don't want any more noise, I don't like the noise, I don't want, you know, all that stuff, I just reply and I copy the video in. And in the videos that we have, you can see cars driving, or you can hear and see cars driving by on the road as the drone arrives, and the drone descends to deliver. And from the point of view of where the observer is recording, you can very clearly hear that the cars are making way more noise than the aircraft is making. Way, way more noise. So that's not a, it's not my excuse. It doesn't give me a free license, of course not. But I know that the, the alternative that we're replacing, it's a far better quality of noise and, and amplitude of noise. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that the UAM in industry will also solve that in the same way. We, we just have a benefit over the alternative that's, that's better. We may increase the number of flights, but I think that ultimately, I believe ultimately noise will be a non-issue for this industry. Mm. Once people experience it, it's an issue now, but once they experience it. That's, that's why we're talking about societal acceptance which is, yes, you have, you have to find trade-offs between uh, what, you, what level of service you get out of it, consumerism, as uh, Bobby was mentioning, uh, compared to the new, new type of uh, noise patterns that you're exposed to, and uh, the trade-off has to be positive. Uh, and uh, we need to communicate possibly with, uh, with citizens on you know, what is the trade-off and why it is adding value to their life. It can be on rescue, it can be on, on uh, you know, uh, having uh, less uh, congestion on, on the ground, it can be uh, a lower noise than a, a delivery truck, it can be on, on a number of things. Yeah, can I just, one, one last little point, I'm sorry, but, but you know, does anyone know how many delivery drivers are killed every day on motorbikes and bicycles carrying non-valuable products to houses? Thousands. In, in, Mexico, in Mexico City alone, 180 a year in Mexico City. In South Africa, 350 a year killed delivering hamburgers. Hmm. Hmm, that's a valid point. Dominique? Yes, the, 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 um, uh, you are opening smaller drones. Um, when we talk about larger um, uh, eVTOL, for instance, transporting persons, um, they will make more noise and um, they will be affecting new population not yet affected by noise. So, um, will these pe people accept uh, noise? I'm not sure. Because when you are in a quiet environment, you will not accept noise. It, it, has, it will have many impacts. I'm not talking just <coughs> about, uh, I don't know, about health impact or, you know, like aircraft. I, I'm not talking about this, but impact on your value of your property. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you live on the top floor, on the top, uh, floor of a building in Paris, um, your property has more value than the one in the, in the street. Why? Because you're quieter and you have um, the sun. But if you have the um, eVTOL flying around, it will lose uh, part of its value. Well, except if you follow the helicopter path again, in that case, we just substitute helicopter by, by UA, uh, UAM. And in that case, it's uh, huge relief for, for the, the people uh, living under the, uh, the, those paths. It's what I, I think. Huh? For the moment, when, when we, we are imagining right now operating from Price CDG to uh, the airport of Isilimuino, when I can tell you, huh, it's the, the noise of, of those UAM, especially the helicopter ones, compared to the peripheric. Uh, okay, there is nothing in common. And the same with the noise of those UAM compared to the aircraft operating at Paris-Charles-de-Gaulle, in both ways. Huh? 
Listen, uh, this, is a, this has been a, a very fascinating discussion. Frédéric, yes. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about <coughs> noise, you know, but I think that social acceptance will be much more important on the safety side, you know, because noise is very subjective and it's a question of convenience, you know, whether it's more convenient to get all your goods delivered very quickly or to have a very silent environment. But I believe that, that if, especially in the beginning of this industry, we have accidents, you know, and there are three different types of potential victims. There's the crew on board of an eVTOL, there's another crew of another aircraft, you know, that may be hit or collide with, with, a, with an eVTOL or a drone, and there's most of all the people on the ground, you know, and if you look at helicopter accidents in, in, in the past 10 years in the UK where a police helicopter, you know, with only three people on board killed 20 people on the ground in a pub, you know, this is where the, the risk and the dangers are, and I believe that this is why it needs to be regulated, mm -hmm. you know, uh, very strictly on the technology side, on the operations side, on, on, on where these things can land and start, because public acceptance will disappear, you know, if we have a couple of, of crashes in, 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 in uh, urbanized areas in cities. So if we want this industry to strive, and then I think that the benefits are higher than the risks, ultimately, you know, in terms of progress, we need to make sure, even if it takes longer, even if it's more costly, and I'm the one that said, you know, cost is an issue, but still, I think that it's the only way for this industry to have a chance is we, it has to be accident free. That's, that's for sure, and we need regulations. We don't like it, let's face it, you know, <laughs> but, but it's, it's the only way to, to, to make it happen. Yeah, you answered one of the questions there as well, and it's, it's well put, and, and I agree. If at the early stages of this industry, we flout regulation or we have accidents, then we have a big problem. That's when we really have a problem with acceptance. Right now, we, that doesn't exist because we haven't gotten there yet. We're not scaling. So the question will be how quickly can you scale something without compromising safety? And at what point does cost come into it? I don't think cost comes into it because actually the cost of building an aircraft for us and for UAM, a safe one versus an unsafe one, there's no difference. It's about the process and the governance and the systems that actually deliver safety. And that's where regulation does come in. And we have decades of aviation experience to borrow from for our industry. Um, and we can ad adjust that to be fit for purpose for our use case. But I think you're, you're, you're right to say it, and it was one of the questions from the audience. Uh, that is the one where we would lose the, the vote from the community if we didn't do that properly. But, but also confidence and safety is very subjective. You look, if you look at a regular airline, you know, if Lufthansa or Air France you know, have a crash and then people die, it's, it's tragic and dramatic, but people will keep on flying with those airlines. Mm. If this had happened to Ryanair or EasyJet at the very beginning, people would have stopped flying with Ryanair and EasyJet yeah. because they would have <laughs> thought low costs, it's, it's, it's more dangerous, you know, which isn't necessarily true, but it's very subjective. And this is a new industry, and therefore, mm. confidence and safety would be way more subjective and therefore way more dangerous. Yeah, agreed. Right, Listen, we, we are asking yeah. you to be tough on yes, certification. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're, this is music to my ears. This is music to my ears. Um, le let us now conclude, and I will, I will ask each of you to, to make some concluding remarks, focusing on how and what you think we as a community should do in order to enhance the societal acceptance of uh, UAM in the future. Dominique, I start with you. <coughs> Sorry. Um, well, you, you, you said this morning that um, uh, EASA was an enabler and um, should not be um, uh, put restrictions, I think, on the UAM operation. I would ask you, as a citizen, I would ask you and the European Commission and the member states to be very careful about these points on the, the environmental impacts, because you are the people who are in charge of the security, safety, um, and health and um, protection of the people of the European citizens. So I think we all agreed here that you should be tough. Good. But be tough on the standards and no standards as well. Okay, thank you. Bobby. Um, one word, engage. 
en engage with all of the stakeholders, proceed cautiously and slowly with all of the stakeholders. For my company, that means we do it hand in hand with the, part with the community. So the schools, the restaurants, the local vendors, the people we fly over, it's a community effort today. And that's not scalable, but today we educate the whole of Europe with what we do in Ireland. And we do it in a collaborative way, in an open way. We share all our data. And for me, that's it, engagement and transparency. Very good. Mark? Well, it's kind of confidence. Uh, we have to bring confidence. So basically, it's what we are doing right now in Pontoise. We work hand in hand with the local community to show them how it works uh, through those uh, flight tests. So basically, safety will be ensured by the French Civil Aviation, I mean, in France. Uh, certification will be ensured by ESA, and then we have just to show how and what are the advantages of those, uh, again, uh, yeah, UAM uh, compared to helicopter, for example. Frédéric? Well, in, in emergency medicine, we say, you know, 10 seconds for 10 minutes. And, and I think that we need to go step by step, take the time to do the things right, and, and have the perfect use cases. Obviously, I'm biased, you know, with uh, rescue services. But I think that this will create acceptance if we take the time and then have the right cases at the start. Thank you very much, all of you. I think uh, uh, we can all give a round of applause for this uh, fantastic panel. Thank you to everybody on the panel. We're now taking a short break for coffee. Please be back here at half past three so we can start again. Thank you very much. The future of air rescue could look like this. Multicopters have been designed primarily for use as air taxis, but are piloted multicopters a viable option in emergency rescue? Could they improve emergency care in Germany? If so, what would this require? To answer these questions, ADAC Luftrettung GmbH, a charitable air rescue service, has launched a feasibility study on multicopters in emergency rescue. The study is the first of its kind in the world. It's supported by the ADAC Foundation, in cooperation with Volocopter from Baden-Württemberg, as well as model regions in Bavaria and Rhineland-Palatinate. The mission of this so far unique research project is to get emergency doctors to patients as fast as possible while increasing their range of operation. The multicopter is by no means designed to replace HEMS helicopters, but rather to supplement them in the best possible way. For the study, the internationally renowned Institute for Emergency Medicine and Medical Management at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich developed two analytical approaches. The first one examined the potential usability of multicopters in Bavaria and Rhineland-Palatinate. The second one computer simulated over 26,000 multicopter emergency missions in two model regions. There were different scenarios focusing on these issues. How fast does a multicopter have to fly? What minimum range is required? And what operating radius is needed for the multicopter to improve emergency rescue in Germany? Having been cared for optimally at the scene, the patient is transported to the clinic by ambulance, as in most cases these days. The multicopter picks the emergency doctor up again, and then it flies on to its next, maybe life-saving, mission. The results of the study are promising. This may be the dawn of a new era 
in emergency rescue.